This uh, man is an opera singer, professional, who happened to become one of our patients because he had an intrinsic brain tumor. And in order to have this brain tumor removed and still preserve his ability to perform his profession, we had to do a very special kind of surgery. And that is what you just saw in the video. The man uh, comes in and uh, we put local anesthetic on his head. Um, and then we uh, open up the skull, expose the brain, and stimulate with electricity throughout his uh, brain, throughout the tumor, as we're moving it. And what you see here on the screen is uh, a cartoon brain. And in pink, it's a cartoon tumor. And we take electrical current and stimulate throughout the surface of this tumor and throughout the brain adjacent to it. And we look for when there's difficulty singing. As we take the tumor out, we continue to stimulate different areas. And when we reach the point where he has difficulty singing again, we stop taking out the tumor. And we have to leave a little bit so that he retains his ability to function. So I'm going to show you the video again, a short segment. And I'd like for you to see if you can notice when the stimulation uh, was interrupting his ability to sing. And I'm very happy to be able to tell you that it's now been two years. And this man has continued to sing professionally throughout Europe. And he's doing very well. He hasn't had any further recurrence. And these types of surgeries really bring a lot to these patients. The reason why I wanted to tell you this is I wanted to introduce the idea that the brain is an electrical organ. What I'm going to tell you about today is a dialogue in the theme of the conference, uh, but a dialogue that we perform electrically with the brain. And I'd like to show you how we can read the signals out from the brain, decode them, and then use stimulation to put signals into the brain and really have a back and forth dialogue. And by the end of the talk, my hope is that you'll understand how we might treat and help heal and retrain the brain after injury. So um, I'm lucky enough that this is my job. I'm a resident neurosurgeon at Stanford. Um, as you heard before, I uh, have been in school for a very, very long time prior to my residency um, with the physics and neuroscience and uh, medicine. But this really gave me a unique set of skills that's uh, really brought a lot to my life. And I'm hoping that as time goes on, it will bring something to the lives of um, my patients and perhaps usher in a new uh, era of neurosurgery uh, that uh, I'd like to be part of. So, First, I'm going to tell you about epilepsy patients and epilepsy patients that have seizures uh, and are unable to be um, treated for their epilepsy with medications alone require surgery. And when we do these surgeries, what we do is we uh, open up the scalp, open up the skull, and put an array of uh, platinum electrodes on the brain surface. Then we close the skull, close the scalp, and they spend about a week in the hospital. During that week in the hospital, their signals are monitored, these brain signals are monitored electrically by the neurologist to try to identify where the seizures are starting. And in that time, some of the patients choose to participate in experiments with us. And so we look at this array of electrodes that we have on the brain surface, and we try to correlate um, behavior with physiologic change. And to do that requires certain mathematics. So uh, I'm going to teach you a little bit of mathematics today. Um, the most fundamental uh, thing that we do is uh, a mathematical way of changing the language from when these measurements that we have uh, have a particular value to how often they have it. And uh, for those of you with an engineering or math background, this is called the Fourier transform. But the principle is this. If we have this brain measurement, we can break it down into a series of brain waves or oscillations or um, rhythms. And each one of these has its own particular frequency and own particular power and we decompose uh, the signal into these uh, component rhythms. And each has its own frequency. And we can reconstruct our original signal from these if we want. And then what we do is we can look at the superposition of all of these frequencies 
to form something called the power spectrum that you see there on the bottom left. And when people engage in some behavior, let's say moving their hand or thinking about their grandmother, in my case I'm thinking about my grandmother because she's in the audience right now, and uh, then when they stop doing that, uh, there's a change that we can see. So in this case, the pink uh, frequency comes and goes uh, during this behavior. And in order to really understand and develop new technologies, we had to understand new things about these signal properties. And we figured something out very early on that I'm going to illustrate to you. So uh, first experiment that we did was we had uh, patients in the bedside, and they would stare at a blank screen. And we would measure one particular power spectrum. Then we would give them some cue, in this case, uh, to move their hand, and we measure another power spectrum that you see there on the bottom left in red. And if we superimpose these two things, we see that in some frequency ranges, there's an increase in power, and in other frequency ranges, there's a decrease in power. And rather than being uh, similar uh, types of change at two different frequencies, there's actually two fundamentally different processes going on. And to understand what these two processes are, I'd like to actually do a demonstration with the people in the room. So if we pretend that everybody here is a neuron, we can understand the statistics of the brain uh, through this demonstration. So first, I'd like everybody to, um, on the count of three, I'm going to count to three, say what day it is today. So one, two, three. Saturday. Great. We all understood Saturday. Okay, now on the count of three, I want everybody to say the month and year that they were born in. One, two, three. So if you listen carefully, you can't make out many of these things other than the person who also added the year, which was 1996, and I made that out. But um, the information that's contained in that is quite large. And if you want to understand what the particular nuances of a brain area are, that's the aspect of the signal that you want to capture. So the reason why people didn't identify this early on is because it's very hard to make that out when you have these brain waves and these brain oscillations, which would be um, when we all understood Saturday, and those are superimposed with when everyone uh, said what their birthday was. So we're going to do another uh, exercise, very similar, uh, to illustrate why this wasn't figured out for a long time. So everybody on this side of the room, when I count to three, I'm going to want them to say the state that we're in right now. Okay, and we can split it down the line right there. And everybody on this side of the room, I would like to say the city they were born in on the count of three, and we're all going to do it together. One, two, three. Right, so we could all hear California, but we couldn't hear any of the others. Well, it turns out when we look at these signals, when we look at brain rhythms, which is this sinusoid that you see on the top right, or sorry, yeah, the top right, uh, that, that's what people had focused on for a long time, and that's where terms like brain waves come from. But it's actually something else that has the same statistics as noise that we call a broadband change that contains this very local information on the brain. And this insight allowed us to build some neat new tools and to start to bull, uh, pull out uh, information from the brain for the first half of this electrical dialogue. So we're really going to focus on this broadband spectral change, or this um, broadband uh, brain signal that looks statistically like noise. And when it increases, we know a brain area is active. And we can use that as a tool. The first example of this was using uh, these electrocorticographic grids, or these electrode arrays implanted on the brain surface for our epilepsy patients, to do the first real-time electrical mapping of the brain surface. And I'm going to show you a video, and I'm going to show you it uh, twice to show you how um, we can extract this information. So the first time, I'd like you to focus on the behavior. And here you have the patient. And on the other side of uh, your screen, you're going to see me. And in the middle of the screen, you're going to see the interpolated brain activity. I'm going to show you the video twice. And the first time, I want you to watch the behavior. And the second time I show it to you, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the bars that you'll see on the screen and see how those correlate in time with the timing of the patient performing this behavior. And you'll also see the activity interpolated on the brain surface. So for the first time, Okay, and what you see on the screen is those bar, each one of those bars is one of the electrodes and the interpolated activity is on the brain. And now I want you to watch it again and watch how quickly we map the brain. And after we did this, other labs around the world started doing this and there's now uh, the first applications are coming out where we can map uh, the whole activity of the exposed brain intraoperatively in a matter of just a few seconds. And this was using that stimulation alone takes uh, minutes. So 
Uh, another application that uh, people have been very interested that I think really illustrates uh, how we'll be able to pull information out from these electrical signals is something called brain-computer interfaces. So it turns out that when you move a part of your body, so if I move my hand right now, and when I imagine moving my hand, the same parts of the brain have very similar activity. And what we can do for people who've lost the ability to move but still have the ability to think, um, so para people that are paralyzed or have locked-in syndrome, is we can take these broadband spectral changes that I told you about, and we can couple them to movement of a cursor on a screen. So when the power in one particular electrode in an area of the brain that's responsible for tongue movement goes up, as this person imagines moving their tongue, then there's going to be an increase in power. And in this video, uh, you can see that there are two areas circled on the brain, and the patient controls the cursor in two dimensions by um, imagining moving their hand, and in that top circle, that's going to uh, you're going to see it turn red as the brain activity increases, and that's going to make the cursor go right. And in the bottom circle, you're going to see uh, the activity as the person imagines moving their tongue. And um, you, this power in the electrode that's circled is going to turn red, and the electrode's going to go up. And so on the screen, the patient is seeing uh, these targets move, and they're modulating their thoughts while they have this happen, and we decode these signals in real time and give it feedback to move this cursor around. And something that's really, really neat about this is after just 10 minutes or so of feedback, the activity that we measure in the brain in these areas uh, that are responsible for moving different parts of the body, even though the patient's just imagining, the activity that you get is larger just by imagining than it is when you actually move. So this tells us that by capturing these signals and performing some kind of feedback on them, we can change the activity in the brain on very, very quick time scales. And later we're going to come in and I'm going to tell you how we want to, instead of giving people visual feedback, we're going to give them electrical feedback. And we think we can make different brain areas interact more strongly, much in the same way as we can make this activity increase by giving them feedback. So the final uh, application I'd like to show you about decoding brain information is uh, decoding perception. And perception is if you look up here and you're seeing uh, me, other than sort of being horrified by my fashion sense, you would see my, you would see the lines that make up uh, my face and my shirt, and that visual information about lines and patches gets converted into um, your concept of a face and of a shirt. And what happens uh, in the brain is we can study those areas where that change happens. In the course of studying those areas, we built a pretty cool tool to decode brain activity that I think we're going to actually be apply, apply to um, heal the brain. And uh, the illustration is as follows. So in the top right of the screen, uh, you're going to see what the patient sees. And images of faces and houses presented very rapidly. On the top left of the screen, you're going to see the brain activity and uh, the, in response to the patient seeing these images. And I'm going to show you uh, that broadband spectral change and also the raw voltage from two electrodes on the bottom left. And I would like you to listen to the sounds, because the sounds that you hear is that uh, that's that broadband spectral change from three electrodes. And you'll be able to decode in real time, much like our algorithms do, what the patient is seeing by listening. Your brain is very good at that. But something that we also do in order to do that decoding is we take these electrical signals and we um, put them in a sort what we call a higher order mathematical space. And here there's a three-dimensional representation of that in the bottom right. And for most of you, that may not be easy to relate to, but for those of you that are engineers and for me, it, uh, there's a lot of beauty in the mathematical abstractions that we can get from these brain signals. And um, so we process the signals, create this space. And what we then do is we take that higher order abstraction and apply emerging uh, methodologies from artificial intelligence that people use for computer vision and robotics uh, to decode these brain signals. And then we make a prediction about whether the patient has seen a face or a house at every instant in time, at every millisecond. And you're going to see those predictions uh, with text that says face or house in red or blue immediately below that image. So in your head, what I'd like you to do is listen to those brain signals and see if you can tell the difference in sound and do decoding yourself about what they're seeing, and also observe how well our algorithms do. So they actually predict with 40 millisecond accuracy when people saw something and what they saw, with, um, and also with about 90% accuracy, 96% accuracy about um, what, what it was they saw. So. 96% of the time, they capture the, we capture the image algorith algorithmically, sorry, and, um, and with 40 milliseconds of accuracy. So our algorithm
algorithms are doing this decoding, and we can read information out from the brain. But what we'd like to do is really have this electrical dialogue. And so the complement of reading information out from the brain is putting information back in. And we can do that with electrical stimulation. Um, the first and most dramatic example of this for me was when I was at the end of my medical school. I knew I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, but I didn't know what kind. And I went to visit um, a man who's become a great mentor for me, Phil Starr. His picture's in the bottom right. And he took me to his clinic. And before we saw the first patient, he said, I want to show you a video. We went in a side room, and he showed me this video of a six- or seven-year-old girl who was lying on the ground and trying to get up on her hands and knees and wasn't able to do this. Uh, at the time, it was very sad, and I thought, well, you know, this is a difficult field to go into. It must, it must mean a lot to try to help these people, but this is quite sad. And, uh, and then we went to see his first patient, and he didn't say anything to me in between the video and when we saw the patient. He opens the door, and a little girl runs up to him and gives him a big hug. And it took me a few seconds to realize it, but it had been the same girl. And Dr. Starr explained to me later that this is what uh, one year of deep brain stimulation can do. So this girl had an electrode implanted in the center of her brain um, to treat a genetic disorder called um, DYT type 1 dystonia. And after one year, it turned a girl who had lost so much function that she couldn't crawl into somebody who could walk and run and give hugs and do all the things that little kids should be able to do. The idea behind this is that electrical activity can interrupt um, brain circuits to treat disease. And there's also something else that's interesting that electricity can do. It can introduce function. And in order to illustrate this, I'm going to show you something that's not from um, brain surgery, but from uh, neuroscience. And this is uh, a neuroscientist named Alyssa Hindle. And you're going to see uh, somebody else holding a wand above her head. And this wand uh, is, induces magnetic uh, fields, which create currents on the brain surface and activate the brain. And I'd like you to listen. You'll hear clicks every time an electrical uh, impulse is generated on the brain surface. And I'd like you to watch her arm while that happens. So right hand, little bit of elbow. OK, so this is pretty cool. But for the applications that we want in neurosurgery, this is a little bit like trying to type with a sledgehammer. So what we're working on is uh, more precise stimulation that's delivered directly on the brain surface. And this image that I'm showing you is um, where an electrical impulse has been delivered, where those two uh, yellow bars are. And um, well, actually, we, I'd like to tell you to look for some pattern there, but this is something we're still working on, because we need to understand this to really close the loop from decoding to stimulation. And if anyone has something that they notice uh, from this particular brain, please find me after the talk. Uh, we would definitely have something to talk about. So my vision is to be able to record from the brain surface, decode the information, and then stimulate the brain in order to treat diseases of, with psychiatric implications, and in order to um, treat motor dysfunction when people uh, have dystonia so they can't move, or Parkinson's so they have trouble starting walking. And um, I'd also like to do this to treat patients like the one that I showed you at the very beginning of the talk. So, before we do that, there's just one last thing. And we're doing this at Stanford. We've been doing it for about uh, two years. And that is we can treat epilepsy. So these very patients that we learned all this information uh, through them volunteering their time, well, now we're starting to be able to create uh, new um, uh, surgical uh, implementations for treating their disease, which is wonderful. So we implant electrodes. Here there's one uh, that's been implanted in an area uh, that's responsible for movement, so we can't surgically remove it. And uh, that it's the circled uh, electrode that you see. And it records information in real time and detects seizures. So this little implanted metal uh, device um, detects the seizure, which you see here in blue, and then delivers three pulses of electrical stimulation and stops the seizure. And this has been shown to drastically reduce the number of uh, seizures that patients have in a day. And over time, it actually uh, reduces uh, not just the number of seizures that are detected and stopped, but we find that after treatment has gone on for about a year, the overall number of seizures goes down. It's wonderful stuff. And uh, in order to treat the patient like the beginning of the talk, who had a tumor that was taken out, and that patient, we were able to take the tumor out, and he didn't lose any function. But some patients do learn function. So to, sorry, some patients do lose function. And in order to treat those patients, uh, we take advantage of a principle that was discovered by a really smart uh, neuroscientist uh, named Donald Hebb from the last century who made this observation about single neurons. And that observation is that, much like people, two neurons that interact um, strengthen the, their connections 
the more they interact. So if you and I uh, meet each other, and just like we, over time, interact more with each other and grow closer, and our connection grows greater, the same thing happens with individual neurons. And we can take advantage of this for uh, function that's been lost by either stroke or, as I'll show you, tumor resection. So imagine uh, these two brain areas. These are uh, brain areas involved with language in green, and they're connected by nerve fibers. And if there's a tumor that's within those nerve fibers, and in the course of re removing that tumor, those nerve fibers are cut, people will lose some of their ability to perform speech. But they do retain some connection between those two regions, as you see there in the dark orange. And I envision that we'll be able to take electrodes, like I've shown you, record from them, decode them in real time with implanted devices, and stimulate both regions at once, taking advantage of Hebb's rule to retrain and regrow connections in the brain. That's my vision for the future of neurosurgery, and I'm really glad I've been able to share this with you today. This is the end of my talk, but I hope that what you can take home is the idea that this electrical dialogue we're having from the brain will allow us to record signals, using, uh, have them processed online with implanted devices and stimulate the brain in order to really help our patients um, overcome diseases that until now have been untreatable. So thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here at UCSD.